Okay, um, without further ado, uh, I think that we know uh, Michael. Michael, it's, uh, it works at Google. It previously worked at Red Hat. It's one of our star contributors on Fineract. And he's helping a lot on, on, on the community and, and driving the innovations and driving and put some order and put some passion and put some discipline on, on, on Fineract. I, I saw your contributions on the email list, and I think that there's a lot of things that I don't see because I'm, I'm not on the, on the development side. So uh, he's going to talk about reinvigorating the community. So Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, you for your, thank you for your, for your kind words. You're, you're being very generous. Um, I am um, throwing in here that this presentation is uh, unrelated to my day job at work. With that out of the way, um, you all know what Apache Fineract is. <clears throat> so I don't think we need to uh, dwell too long on, on this. Um, what I want to talk about in this presentation for the next uh, 40 minutes, I think I got, is um, not so much about what I do for the community, but, but uh, what others do and how come that um, in the last 12 months or so, we got a noticeable spike of contributions, right? This graph here is quite interesting. The project started, got incubated at Apache a number of years ago. Um, actually, this graph shows uh, not since the Apache incubation, but the original Git code even before that, I believe. Um, very heavy activities originally, then sort of a period of quiet, very quiet around here, and then a sudden spike of activities in the last 12 months. And I want to look a little bit at what we did as a community to uh, to make that happen, right? To reinvigorate our community. Um, community doesn't just happen. Putting a, a source code on a GitHub repo and hoping that people will show up is not quite how it works. Um, but I believe that there are certain things we can do, uh, you can do as a community to uh, get contributions and make people uh, part of your of your community. This is using Fineract as an example, but I think most of the lessons here are not that specific to Apache Fineract, but are perhaps reusable for other uh, Apache and general open source projects. I want to start with something very basic, um, very uh, kind of obvious, but, but that's worth remembering. Um, it's super important uh, to be very, very welcoming, right? I think it's easy for us to forget how confusing open source can be if you're new to it. Um, if we've been doing this for a while, um, we find it obvious. There's pull requests and there's a mailing list, but the whole process around it, like how does this work? What do I have to do here? Who is telling me what I should do? Am I allowed to change code? Can I just change any code? Oh, I really can change the code. Um, people will actually review my code. People I don't know will review my code. Um, I can have an impact on this project by contributing my own new features, my own um, bug fixes for it. Um, to some people, this is obvious, but I, over the years, have learned that to many, it's actually not. I think this is something we forget sometimes, especially those of us with technical backgrounds. Um, I like to uh, remember that everybody started somewhere and perhaps sometimes think back to how you started. In my own case, actually, um, I started with contributing to Mifos uh, back when it was um, in a different incarnation. Um, there was an IRC channel. Somebody guided me along on that IRC channel and sort of taught me a little bit how to use some uh, Git commands. It had just migrated to Git at that time. And um, that was very helpful. So I still, um, from time to time, remember that and try to do the same thing for uh, new people 10 years later. Um, it really does matter. I, th I think there is a fine line of sort of pushing somebody to not want to engage in a community uh, by being a little too abrupt um, and by making somebody want to come back and raise more pull requests that you set the tone for at the very beginning of an engagement. The first time somebody shows up on your project's mailing list, the first uh, reactions on a pull request, I do believe they really make a difference. Be extra welcoming, humble, encouraging, friendly, just generally nice. Um, 
is one important element of building community. Um, I think other than being just generally nice and sort of friendly, there are a few concrete things that we can do as a community. Um, one thing is the whole model of how we interact with, uh, with, contrib with contributors. So uh, perhaps others um, have had the same experience. Um, it's fairly common for people who are vocal on mailing lists to get private emails. Uh, many people are not that familiar with this idea of public mailing lists and prefer speaking to you privately. Um, I regularly get uh, emails from uh, people who reach out who are basically asking if I can help them to, whether it's set up a server or whether it's um, run the code. Um, one thing we like to do there is to use that as an opportunity to educate people how to use public mailing lists, right? Again, that's not that obvious. Uh, if you've never been on a mailing list, if you are used to um, Facebook and Twitter, um, you might be pu um, pulled off, pu pushed off, sorry, by the notion of getting that many emails. So explaining that you can filter and search for emails, explaining that you can look for emails that were addressed to you, um, and just basically handhold explain. I've done this more than once, and I think it makes it makes a difference to open the doors of your community. Um, if people don't get it, just re-explain it very kindly. Say like, look, um, I'd like to help you, but I prefer doing this on a public list instead of on a direct email exchange. It, it makes a difference. Another thing is this whole idea of uh, give, giving people the background to solutions, right? It's one thing to um, tell somebody, here is how you've solved your problem. Like, I don't know, I can't build it and saying, um, well, you need to use Java 11 instead of Java 8. Um, it's better to explain to people in as much detail as you have time for why something is the way it is. So somebody posts a bug report, point them to the source code. There's a chance that they might go looking for the source code. Um, an error message, point them at where the error message actually said what the problem was so that the next time they probably learn how to read error messages. Um, this has a double effect of the person you're talking to in your community, but also informing people who are reading along. I think we sometimes underestimate the uh, amount of people who are basically just reading along lists, right? There's a silent uh, group of people who is sort of seeing what's going on on lists. Okay, what is this? And if you, on your community interactions, very verbosely explain um, solutions to problems, you can help your community grow, right? There's a little trick I use sometimes uh, that is not to uh, always fully solve a problem. It's easy, of course, if somebody comes along and just fixes something for you. But um, giving hints to people and really empowering them to find the last step of the solution themselves, I think, is a very um, good measure of, of building community. Uh, give, perhaps, hints to source code. Like, this error is uh, probably something in Java class so-and-so, link to GitHub. Um, Perhaps you would uh, like to try X, Y, Z, some, some fix. Instead of just going ahead and fixing, even if you know the solution, even if you could say in the email exactly how to fix it, I think you're probably helping your community grow better um, by teaching your contributors and, and your interested users how they can fish themselves instead of doing all the fishing for them, right? A completely different thing is that it's really important in, in open source projects to uh, make it very easy to try your, your code, your project. Again, this seems trivial. This is something that um, we, uh, we, we underestimate, I think. Um, Finract uh, 12 months ago supposedly was easy, right? You can um, clone the source code. You can um, build the war file. You can deploy the war file into a Tomcat after you edit the XML file of the data source. But we already lost some people there, right? 12 months later, we had some great contributions. Um, Petri really made a difference there. Big shout out to you. Um, we can now run uh, Gradle boot run in one command and everything runs. We have a uh, Docker compose file. Uh, Podman is the same thing as Docker, but better. So use Podman instead of Docker. 
um, Podman Compose Build, Podman Compose Up, and you get a full instance with a, a database, with a front end running. These things make a difference, right? The easier it is to, um, the, the lower the barrier to entry is to try out uh, a, pro a, a product like Finract, the, the more you get people motivated to actually uh, try it out and perhaps make contributions afterwards. Uh, related to that, of course, is uh, making it easy to actually see the software running. So since six months or so, we got uh, finrack.dev, a site where the Finrack source code actually runs live, um, always updated. There's a separate talk about this day after tomorrow that I'm giving. I think that's part of this um, idea of making it easy for people to get started in your community. Um, if you just want to know what Finrack is, you perhaps don't want to start building it yourself. But if there's a link you can click in the readme of the project where you can see the thing running and try it out, um, you gained a few hours there to get somebody interested in your project. And that's uh, I think that's really important. Um, moving on, um, about pull requests, uh, two or three points here. Um, Finrack used to have many uh, open unattended to pull requests. Um, that's typically a bad thing. If you're a new contributor and you see that there's a huge backlog of open um, pull requests that were ignored, you're likely gonna be less motivated to jump on a project, right? Why would I add something to a project where there is already a hundred things that nobody seems to care about? Um, so for maintainers of a project to um, actively groom the backlog of pull requests, I think is fairly important to um, reinvigorate a community. It's something we did over the last 12 months actively. And I think that's another reason and part of why, why we managed to get contributions going again. Um, tending to uh, open pull requests has several aspects. Um, reviewing them, um, I personally think it's okay to expect quality in pull requests. So this isn't about you know, somebody just pressing the merge button when, when people contribute things, but actually looking at what is being proposed, um, have some constructive feedback, always constructive. Um, of course, when we review code, um, we are taking into account that different people have different um, experiences and backgrounds. So careful not to sort of block pull requests just forever and fall into this analysis paralysis trap, right? So, uh, pull request merge that's done is better than a perfect one that just never gets merged. Careful also not to get too much into nitpicking. I think we made great progress in Finract about this. So nitpicking is the idea of saying this is indented wrong and we should add a new line here or something. With Mantan's great work from the Summer of Code project, we now have automated code formatting and uh, code um, style checks, which make builds fail uh, if somebody uh, doesn't format their source code. And that means that a human doesn't have to come and nitpick about that. That, that helps, and I think, in building community. Um, it's also okay to sh close old pull requests, right? If somebody doesn't react to uh, review feedback, just go ahead and close them. They can always be reopened. That's probably okay. Um, back to the point uh, made earlier on mailing lists on hand-holding, that's particularly important on pull requests as well. Again, I think we forget how not obvious it may be um, for new contributors how to see why a build failed. Um, where is the log file? Why is this pull request read? What does that mean? If you're doing this for the very first time, it's actually not obvious at all. So for maintainers to um, really kindly guide along people who are making their first contributions is super key to growing community. Something I used to do years ago and have moved away from um, is fixing up people's pull requests. So if somebody throws a pull request to a project and says, here is a fix for something and it doesn't build, you might ask, do you want to fix it? Here is what is failing. That, I don't know, check style is wrong or something. And years ago, I used to then basically pull those contributions and, and fix them. Um, and over the years, I've come to the conclusion that is um, counterproductive. I, I think it's ultimately better for a project if you help people to learn how to contribute. And if they ignore the, the feedback, then it's probably not important enough for them, right? It's probably not important enough to make the, the contribution to the project. And by basically fixing up things, you're, you're sending the wrong signal. So meanwhile, we're, we're letting pull requests occasionally exp um, expire on, on Finract. And I think uh, for the long-term viability of a project, that is actually the better approach. 
after I've changed my opinion about that a little bit. Um, this is an example uh, of something that happened uh, recently, right? Here, uh, uh, somebody interested in contributing to the project seems to have found a bug um, uh, about something that should be changed in the line uh, 543 of this savings accounts charge class here, but actually comments on the, uh, th the code on GitHub without raising a pull request. It's just sort of an inline comment. I'm actually not even sure exactly how one does that technically. Um, so the right thing here is to very friendly leave a comment and say like, um, thank you very much for your interest, but um, we really need a pull request for this, not just a comment. Um, and here is how you go about doing this. Maybe add a friendly link. Say like, if you've never done this before, here is how you can learn how to do it. Uh, very simple kind of basic measures, but um, which help to grow community and get um, uh, some people uh, interested in contributing. You'll also lose some people, right? Some people might ignore this and might not come back. That's fine. That's totally fine, right? As a maintainer of an open source project, you uh, do the best you can to help people on board and you'll win some and you'll lose some. That's totally fine. Um, another aspect on building community, growing community is um, the old question of, I think this is an interesting project, where can I help, right? How do you actually find things to do for contributors on a project? Um, of course, people can ask on mailing lists. Not everybody will. People might be shy. People might not want to post. Um, one thing that works really well that, of course, other open source projects do as well, have a list of beginner issues and curate that list. Um, we set this up. We used to have it always, but it wasn't super clear in, in Finneract. Um, and we used to have different tags on Jira. And uh, sometime this summer, uh, I went about and set up this Jira dashboard um, with a clear, unique tag. So just a beginner tag, not starter, not begin, uh, not easy or something. But let's just all, all contributors, um, all maintainers, let's use the same tag, the beginner tag. Um, and this seems to work. Um, people occasionally come to this page and uh, find on the Jira dashboard that we now have on the ASF Jira, the first list of issues in the upper left-hand corner on our dashboard, which is recommended beginner issues, currently 20 or so issues on it. Um, that's a way to help people get started. I think showing people also what's going on is important, right? You might be more motivated to work on something if you see that other people are working in, in related areas. I'm just doing a time check here, yeah, we're good. And um, that's something else that we have on our dashboard. Uh, in the middle of, of our new Jira dashboard on Apache Finneract, um, the activity stream where you can see, oh, somebody else has um, self-assigned an issue. Oh, somebody has closed an issue. Really sort of feel the beat of the project. Um, another tab, uh, another list on that dashboard um, is what issues got resolved. Um, discussions on issues are one thing, but ultimately we want people to actually make contributions and solve issues and close issues, right? So the list of resolved issues um, and seeing how uh, issues get added here and issues get closed um, is, is another way to show people that your project is moving and, and to uh, inspire them to want to be one of them who closes issues. Um, as you get people who start contributing, there is uh, an important small practical measure that, that I think is super important in open source, right? Um, we uh, have different kinds of contributors, um, but in Finneract's case, there are a number of people who do this as volunteers um, or who do this as a, aside from their job, like their, their job, um, maybe some work related to Finneract, but making an upstream contribution is more sort of a personal thing that they do. Um, I think saying thank you for every contribution, um, celebrating successes, small successes, this is great. Uh, it's cool that we have this contribution. Thanks for this bug fix. Um, it's, it's hard to do too much of that, right? It's cheap, it's quick. Um, just do it for your projects, for your communities. Uh, be, be grateful, show that gratefulness as a maintainer. And um, I think it helps, right? There's nothing, there's nothing, um, it's gratifying to, to, to get thanks like that. Um, we tried something out in Finneract um, that I want to give a shout out to. Uh, at some point uh, earlier this year, it occurred to me, why not just um, having uh, a thank you email every week? It wasn't that complicated. I gave it some thought how to make this as easy as possible for maintainers. Um, 
and came to the conclusion that um, with uh, Jira issue subscription, this is actually pretty easy to do. So we have a Finneract resolved last week filter and a subscription that sends the list of issues that were uh, resolved in the last week. Um, I, I couldn't quite get it to automatically send to the dev list, so it sends it to me and I forward it, but it literally takes three seconds, right? So forward the list, hey, thanks everyone who made a contribution in the last week, issues closed. Um, it's easy, it's cheap, it's nice. Um, it helps people uh, keep informed about what's uh, been happening in community. Uh, it seems to me that we have people who are following along with the mailing list, more so than on the GitHub repo. Um, so if you're uh, not following every review on the on the GitHub repo, um, you don't have to watch the repo, uh, but being subscribed to the mailing list, getting occasional updates on what's going on in the community, this is a nice way. And, and it shows gratitude of the project to contributors. A slightly different aspect um, is uh, making uh, open source contributions uh, a very friendly competition. Um, it, this is not about who uh, sort of does the most contributions or who has the, 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 the most lines or something, but this is a, an aspect that is common in most open source communities, right? Uh, some of you would have noticed that on GitHub, there's a page somewhere that shows um, uh, who contributed how much um, that shows over time. You can sort of do these filtering things on GitHub. Um, that's part of the open source culture and there's nothing wrong with it. Um, bit of friendly, uh, friendly competition, sportive competition, never hurt anyone. That's totally cool. One of the um, uh, boxes that we have on, again, the Jira dashboard that we set up um, that is available at the, I think, first or second link of the Apache Finneract readme, that dashboard. There's a list of um, total issues resolved, not over the last week or so, but lifetime. Um, I think some people uh, get a kick out of, uh, of looking at that and, and that's very much part of the open source culture. Uh, larger communities do this. You can find online, of course, stats of which con uh, companies contributed how much to whatever it is, Linux kernel, Firefox, your favorite open source project. Um, doing a bit of that in your community, in our case here for Apache Finnerack, I think doesn't hurt. Um, a completely different topic. Uh, we at some point started setting up automation for Apache Finneract, and I have a feeling that has something to do with some of the reinvigoration that we saw in our community. So that's something worth talking about here for a minute or two on, on this slide. So artificial intelligence is eating the world, bots steal jobs, make bots work for you, right? In software development, there's a number of things um, you can automate and you should automate in your projects. Um, I think I've already mentioned before the work that Manthan's been doing for format and quality checks. Um, others have helped with this as well. Uh, Finneract, um, summer interns, I hope I'm not, I'm not forgetting uh, the various contributions that have been made over the summer here. Um, but we have uh, automated dependency updates. We've set up the renovate bot that basically goes around and says like, hello, here is a third party dependency that could be updated. Um, sometimes they don't work. Sometimes a human has to um, look at why a version bump isn't working. But the fact that a bot is proposing them for you is reducing work for um, human contributors. But I think the more important point is, is that it keeps a bit of activity on the project going. So if you get a failed pull request from a bot, um, that's probably something that uh, would have taken longer for uh, contributors to uh, remember to upgrade and, and to uh, do something about an action. Um, bots can really help, um, whether it's for third-party upgrades, whether it's format, um, code quality checks. We added a lot of code quality checks in, in Finneract over the summer. We now have error prone. We now have find bugs. Um, we now have, um, I think we don't have the security one, but that's an open issue. Um, there is also a bot that we set up a few months ago that um, basically checks for stale old unactioned pull requests. Again, something that helps the project to, to keep traction. So um, why not save maintainers work um, and have a bot comment on, hello, this pull request has not been uh, updated in a week or two or four, whatever the, the frequency is you choose for your project. 
Um, in Finrac, we set it to four weeks. Um, and then after another four weeks, or so two full months, um, we actually automatically close pull requests now. Um, that's that's helpful. It, it reduces manual work and it keeps the project active and alive even without maintainers having to, to do work there. There is actually a bunch of these automations. There's a framework called ProBot that you can use to write your own uh, bots if you want to get really fancy there. Um, the title of the slide here is, is cheat with a bit of a, uh, a joke. Um, I don't think this is cheating, right? This helps keeping project active and adds real value. That's totally fair. A uh, completely different topic um, for reinvigorating communities. Um, it's really important to regularly release. Um, this is something we did badly in, in Finract. Um, totally fair also to, to recognize where we can improve. Um, I think our 1.4 release was long overdue. And thanks again to a volunteer stepping up here. Thanks, Alex. Um, we managed to get that out of the door. Um, perhaps sometimes as developers um, and, and maintainers of a community, it's easy to underestimate the importance of getting releases out. End users do value stable releases. I put stable in quotes here because um, the Finneract uh, code base, now that we have continuous um, builds, uh, technically is already fairly stable every day, right? It's not like our build is broken or we have like major features completely broken. Our integration tests would already cover that and, and detect that um, anytime. Um, so theoretically, uh, cutting a release is just a, a snapshot in time. Um, but practically, people really seem to seem to find this useful. Um, something that um, we've discussed on a Jira issue here, Finrac 876, is um, whether releases could be further automated. Um, some, some days I wonder whether um, we could even move to a fixed um, time box release schedule, right? Like how crazy would it be to think that every two months or every three months or whatever the, the frequency we would decide as a community, there would be a, a Finrac release cut. Um, People contribute their pull requests, and you basically know that whatever you contribute within a month or two or three is available in a in a release. Um, I think it's something for us to to consider, and and uh, uh, as we go into twenty twenty one, and and cut more frequent releases, our our end users, which is what we really want to reach, right? We want to build a platform for financial inclusion, um, and if we have merge pull requests that are not released they're of less value to our eventual end users. Um, how do we, um, a few slides, two or three slides more on, on the people front of things now, slightly switching gears here. Uh, so you've got a community, you've got project, um, you've set up a Jira dashboard, you've got uh, uh, understood that um, you're gonna be helpful for for people who want to do something. There's another angle, right? There's also asking people to do things, and this is an interesting uh, this is an interesting um, angle of, of managing an open source community. Um, I semi jokingly here put as the first line on the slide: "It's free to ask people," um, and and it, it's true, right? It's, it's something maybe to remember sometimes. If there is something that needs doing, I don't know, some bug or some build that's failed or some pull request that needs reviews or whatever it is that needs doing in, in, in your community at the day. Um, just asking people is, is fine, right? If people are in your community, they, they want to help. And if you know of something that needs to get done and there are people who want to do things that don't know what's the next urgent thing, the next most useful thing to do, just ask. The most important thing is probably never to um, expect somebody to have to do something for you, right? If you work as a volunteer in an open source community, um, it's inappropriate to say, fix this for me. But saying, this looks like something you may be interested in fixing is a completely different thing. Very respectfully, um, also fairly specifically and clearly, like this doesn't work, is this something you would have time to fix for me? 
it might not work always. People are busy, people have lives. And on the volunteer side, um, this is different in other projects where people are um, uh, have uh, corporate backings to work on things and there's perhaps more of a, an organization in the background that schedules things. But in a volunteer-driven project, it's super um, important to just communicate and ask. That's totally fair, it's totally fine. Um, if you expect to be ignored, sometimes you won't be. In order to do that, it helps to know your community. Just gonna drink a bit. If um, as a maintainer on an open source project, you know a little bit who is who on your community, um, of course that makes it easier to uh, basically uh, prod people in a sense and, and friendly, friendly ask, hey, do you wanna help with this? Um, moving on. Still on the people front, right? Um, you do want to keep your community growing. Uh, you do want to keep um, new committers joining. Um, this is something that's really worked for us in Finract over the last 12 months. Again, some of the uh, leading contributors that emerged um, have been invited to, to become um, committers. Um, it's something not every project gets right. I think there is a history in open source of people being very protective of their of their code and like this is ours or mine or this is not something that we would like we welcome people contributing but but we don't want people to have the full privileges of, of committership um i think it's important to strike the right balance there and i think in finract at least over the last 12 months we got it right i think we have opened our doors and added actually several a handful of new committers um I think it is a balance, right? Um, so in your project, if you kind of open the doors too wide and and just basically make everybody who commits uh, uh, one fix and who raises a pull request to be a committer, you potentially get more uh, work dealing with quality issues. So balancing out um, where it makes sense to add new committers and where um, people perhaps need a bit more time to learn the open source way to be able to make effective committers is um, is fair game in open source. Um, contributing uh, quality code that is actually merged um, and over a sustained period, that does matter, right? That is the bar in, in uh, open source uh, committership. Um, one practical signal for, for any open source project uh, when to promote somebody to committer is uh, people who start to uh, chime in on other people's pull requests, right? I think there's this switch. People start working on open source with their own things. You come because either you want to fix a problem or a contribute enhancement that uh, you have or your organization have, maybe those who pay your bills have. Um, and at some point, you become part of the community and have this reflex of like, oh, somebody else proposed something. Let me look at what that is, right? That's a tipping point, I think, in the uh, evolution of, of uh, open source um, contributors. When you don't only care about what you want out of the project, but when you become interested in the well-being of the project and you realize that in order to do that, you can play a role and help review other people's code. Um, nobody's gonna ask for that. Nobody says you have to review somebody else's code. These things, tend to emerge organically in, in healthy open source communities. And people like that are definitely those who should be promoted committers very, very quickly. Completely different topic, how am I doing on time? That's fine, right? Four minutes. Um, stepping back, sometimes in open source, uh, as a maintainer, it's important to uh, know when to uh, give space to others. Um, it's probably better for your community, right? Uh, knowing knowing when um, you want to leave space for others to, to do something. Um, I'll let you in a little secret. This is what happened with the Fenerac 1.4 release. Um, I, at some point this summer, made the decision that uh, if Fenerac needs a release, then there should be somebody somewhere in the community who has an interest in stepping up to do that. And of course, we found somebody, of course. Um, Alex, you, you stepped up and, and let that, um, and uh, that's healthy, right? And if 
nobody steps up to continue maintaining things or to review code, well, that's a sign that the community is where it's at. And then it's perhaps fair if things get slow or things don't happen. Um, it's probably better if, if uh, you know, things come out instead of uh, uh, one or two heroes driving a project alone. So no heroes culture there, hashtag, is, is important for healthy open source communities that thrive and to uh, grow communities. Slowly going to wrap up here. Um, I think something that's interesting to consider is why you're in an open source project. So this is a more personal front now, less on, on individual projects. Um, for those of you listening in, um, uh, have you considered what makes you uh, contribute to a project? There are various reasons, and I think they're all fair. I don't think any of them are right or wrong or better or worse, or there's, there's nothing like that. Um, but it's interesting to consider that for oneself, right? Why are you in an open source project? Is it because you're learning how to code? Is it because um, it's a volunteering opportunity? Do you believe in a cause? Is it just fun? Totally fair, totally fair. You want to have some fun on um, uh, an interesting project, um, cool. But then do it for having fun, right? Don't do it if it frustrates you. Um, if you want to learn, totally fair. Contribute as much time as you can to learn. Uh, read along uh, other code and, and uh, pull requests and learn from it as much as as, uh, as it benefits your learning. Are you paid to do it? Um, is your boss telling you to go fix a bug in an upstream project? That's totally cool. Happens a lot. Um, a lot of the larger open source projects are run like that. People don't force, not, don't necessarily realize that. Um, some people have a sort of idealized vision of open source, but um, Many uh, large projects run because um, there's commercial interest behind it. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, something to realize here is that being friendly doesn't necessarily mean bending backwards, bending over backwards to solve everybody's problem, right? The first slide there that said, be welcoming, be, be, uh, be open as a community. Um, I think for, for volunteer contributors, it's totally fair also to accept that they can help with some things and leave uh, some things unanswered. Um, perhaps others will pick it up if the community is big enough, um, or or things will not uh, not go answered. That um, that is a healthy reflection of the state of the community. And I think I said this, said this before. It's in the project's best uh, long term interest to teach a community how to fish. Uh, make it easy. Make it easy to fix bugs. Make it easy to contribute. Make it easy to try out uh, things on a on a server or, or to have a local instance running. Um, and, and teach our fish instead of going fishing. I will end with a last slide. Um, uh, an open source project such as Apache Finract um, is uh, open source in the sense that um, anybody is free to use it, look inside it, modify it, and free to actively contribute to it. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a free, um, package of software that you get free support for and that somebody will run for you for free. Um, that's that's sometimes important to gently remind or clarify. That's totally okay. Um, you want to be part of this community because you understand that together we're stronger, that everybody contributing the features they need, fixing the bugs that affect them, ultimately creates a better software for everybody. Um, Contributing to an open source project is not just about code. Um, if you help others on the mailing list, so if you respond to people facing problems with the software and the mailing list, if you contribute better documentation to the projects, just add test coverage. Um, if you report bugs, clear bug reports, this is broken, open a JIRA issue about it, that's absolutely a way of contributing to open source, right? Um, uh, more uh, outward facing activities, blogging about uh, features, um, uh, organizing events. Um, those are all ways of contributing to open source, right? Um, pretty much, I think this is coming up on 40 minutes. Um, there's a few links here on uh, community uh, resources that are interesting if you want to learn more about how to uh, successfully uh, reinvigorate an open source community. Javier, I'm going to stop there. Um,
don't know how we're doing in time for questions. If you want anything addressed, pop it in on the chat. And Javier, if you're there and you want to take back over. Hope this session was useful and has um, given some of you an idea on the uh, measures taken on the community front. So this talk wasn't very technical. Um, my presentation on Wednesday about the cloud hosting is going to be more technical. Um, thank you for the feedback, Patrick, in the session. Hello. Yes, I'm here. Um, thank you, Michael, for your presentation. And um, it was very, very uh, interesting. And I, I learned a lot on how other projects work and, and the things that we need to do and, and, and the cheats that we need to implement on, on how to use both.